You're listening to Hearts at Work, a podcast brought to you by P-Cubed about people who care and how their compassion fuels change. Hearts at Work explores the remarkable stories of those who are dedicated to helping others. Get ready to be inspired. We all have a lot of stress in our lives, at home, at work. It doesn't matter. There's always something in today's busy world to grab your attention, to take your time, kind of knock you off your game. You start the day a little tired. You have some coffee, juice yourself up, get ready for work. And on your way in, there's traffic. You get to the office. There's a coworker who's annoying or a boss who is keeping you down or whatever it is. There's just always something that, that, prevents you from being your best in today's world and everything moves so quickly. That is my segue into life coaching, which to me was a mystery until I took a course and got certified in it last year. I'm Adam Natchberg, a former Wall Street Journal journalist and uh, now part-time life and career coach. And I'm very new to this game and I respect my elders in terms of those who came before and one of those happens to be Richard Taliaferro, who I had the pleasure to work with at the Wall Street Journal for a number of years. Great journalist, diligent, awesome writer, great ideas. And I reconnected with Richard recently to talk to him and discovered that he was now making a career of life coaching. And you guys are here to hear about Richard and life coaching, and we promised that Richard would demystify it for you. So let's get to it. Richard, I, I've given a little Reader's Digest version of your bio. I first want to thank you for being here. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me on, Adam. Appreciate it. I really was surprised to hear that you had been a life coach for for such a long time. You've been you know, studying and, and certified. Could you talk to us and tell us about yourself? Just Give an expanded version of your biography and your experience in life before you pivoted into to life coaching. Sure, sure. And, you know, in a previous life, I was a news editor, senior news editor with the Wall Street Journal. I was at the Journal for 25 years. I worked, you know, in New York, worked in Brussels for a little bit, and had extensive experience on the print side. Uh, video side and did some work on the cable TV news side. And so the story of how I got to coaching was, you know, really getting into personal development and had always been in that space, really enjoy being in that space. And so found my way to, to coaching, you know, for two reasons. One, because I really enjoyed the the work. My life was changed by a nutrition coach uh, about 16 years ago, 16 or 17 years ago, when I was overweight, uh, living a sedentary lifestyle, and worked with a nutrition coach to get my baseline to a new beginning in a new place and that really put me on the road to better health and sort of better outlook on my career so when when you went through that kind of transformation i i guess it was it sounds like it was more than just physical it sounds like your your mind was involved in that yeah let me ask you though how did you sort of make the leap from 25 plus years in media to life coaching, like that's not a natural adjacency, I don't think, is it? <laughs> no, no, it's not. You know, I, I've always liked and enjoyed personal development. And after that experience with working with a coach, that sort of stuck in my head that maybe I can make a living uh, as a life coach uh, someday. And what actually it, you know, ended up happening was you know, journalism being 
what it is on the business side. Several years ago, back in 2016, I decided, you know, there was a round of buyouts coming out, and I was thinking to myself that I needed to have a plan B at a certain point. And so coaching seemed to be a natural fit for me. And being interested in personal development and looking at coaching as a particular lifestyle to engage in. What happened was after the buy-ons came, I thought, okay, I probably need to have a plan B. And so I started investigating other school, you know, life coaching schools, found a good school that I could, that was a good fit for me. Um, called It was called the Life Coach Institute, uh, sorry, the Health Coach Institute, and started working with them, found a good program with them, and really spent about eight months getting my health coaching certification, um, you know, as I was working at the journal, uh, I would do my uh, certification lessons during the evenings when I came home from the office. I was working with um, partners uh, throughout the, you know, throughout the country uh, as we were going back and forth and learning lessons together. And I got the opportunity to actually do the program, you know, deliver the program to two practice clients, which was an enormous help. Can we scroll back a bit? I just want to unpack this for sure. listeners. Uh, first, how do you find a life coaching school? I, I mean, when I open Google, for example, I, you, know, you can find anything on Google, but three quarters of it are sponsored ads or sponsored content or promotion or something. Um, did you get referrals from friends? Did you use search? And then how did you, did you collect a number of schools? Like what was your process like to find the right program for you? The, well, the process was actually going to a couple of in-person open houses at a couple of schools in Manhattan, and they didn't quite seem to be a good fit fit for me. I didn't feel comfortable there. I didn't feel like I was going to learn a whole lot there. So I you know, did what everybody else does and went online, started doing searches and found HCI and it immediately felt like home to me. They were invested in not just producing great coaches, but also enhancing your personal development at the same time. And so it felt like home to me working with them. So I've got to ask this question though, because you and I and some of our listeners have worked in the same Wall Street Journal newsroom where even the nicest person has a dorsal fin. It's tough. You know, <laughs> yeah. like it's like playing for the Yankees or yeah. Manchester City. I was going to say Manchester United, but they've kind of sucked in the last <laughs> last few years, but and then you go from that to this like real touchy feely environment that, you know, you talk about feels right. I, I, I'm still kind of missing the connection between how a journalist moves from that environment where you're only as good as your next scoop. Yeah. To yeah. slowing things down and, and kind of trying to focus on, getting people to perform better. You know, it's, it's just, I don't know. I don't see the obvious connection to it. Why was that something that you said, gee, I, I think I should try to do this. You know, I, I've always been someone who's been keenly interested in personal development outside of the office. And you're right. It's not, you, they don't seem to go together, but I didn't let, that stopped my curiosity of in in delving into you know those touchy feely subjects you know those crunchy granola types of things and I always felt doing that in looking at different reading different personal development books really helped ground me give me a sense of direction um 
you know, it even in, you know, still working in a newsroom and before coaching, I tried to bring all of those personal development totems that I was reading and picking up into my work. So on a very personal level, it wasn't a it wasn't unnatural for me. Now maybe looking from the outside it was, but in you know, internally it wasn't it was natural. Right. Uh, when you talk about self help stuff, like you know, we're not talking about Marie Kondo decluttering personal development type stuff. What what were you reading that kind of got you hooked on the notion of helping other people? Um, you can help yourself. You know, a, a lot of books, you know, there were, it's a great book by the author Albert Murray. Now it's not a, it's, you know, it's not a traditional uh, self-help book by any means, but it's a book that Albert Murray wrote called The Hero in the Blues. And he, where there's, there's a crucial section in the book where he talks about heroic action and, you know, taking heroic action even when it's uncomfortable. Uh, so that was a really um, big waypoint for me in terms of uh, in terms of books I read. And another another book was a, again a non-traditional book called Zen and the Art of Poker. And I'm not a poker player, okay? I don't have a poker face, but I think if you I felt reading that book, there were life lessons in that book that went beyond just a poker table and a casino arena. Yeah, you know, right. I've always been someone who reads those types of books to look at putting those things into action. And so that's and that's what I'm looking for in. Books in books like that, podcast is things of that nature. So, so you went from the Murray and the other books, yeah. the poker book, mm -hmm. to podcasts. Um, you went into personal development. Yes, yeah. uh, the weight loss you talked about, changing a lifestyle, and you kind of found your way into some of these uh, open houses yeah. with life coaching sessions in Manhattan. And okay, we promised to demystify. So you picked what was called the Health Institute. Is that right? The Health, Health Coach Institute. Yeah, Health Coach Institute. Right. You picked that. Yeah. It it meshed most closely with what inspired you, I guess. Is that fair to say? Yeah, it's totally fair to say. Yes. And then you start taking classes. You described it earlier as a an eight month process. So to demystify it for us, what do you do for eight months? Are you, I, I, I'm not making fun of this because I went through a, my own process, but, uh, you know, I think some people think it's like chanting or brainwashing or lying down on a couch. And I know it's not. Can you talk through your experience? What did you, how did you become a life coach in eight months? It was learning different methods of coaching and really human behavior and what in what are the things that motivate human beings and go and learning how people are people, you know, we, you know, we learn that people are, in general are looking for three things. It doesn't matter who they are. Those three things are love, safety, and belonging. And so it, in that, and those three things drive the behaviors of what, people do so we learned a lot about that uh there was you know one section where we learned about different and again going back this is a health coaching uh certification i was going through so we learned a lot about the best ways to drink water the best ways to have coffee the best ways to have alcohol in ways that are healthy and are additive to your life. Um, so you know, learning what? <laughs> Sorry, you lost me there. Yeah, yeah. It's we learn. You know, 
we learn how to be responsible with with our food, with what we consume. It's not, it's in, again, and actually one of the things I do like about this program is, liked about the program was, it's not one of deprivation. It's one, it's a program of enjoying, enjoying your life, enhancing your life, and doing it in a responsible way. Does that make sense? That makes more sense. Yeah, sorry. The way you were explaining it before, I just was like, it, suddenly we're talking about alcohol and, and drinking, and I didn't get it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and yeah, it, it's, again, it's just being responsible. And, and enjoying your life at the same time. Um, and, and of course, we learned how to deliver to deliver the program that they outlined for us and also practice actually delivering that program to someone, which I found amazing and wonderful because you could, it gave you the sense of how the program lands with a, a potential client and it gives you practice to to work to work through the program to prepare for each session that you have to do. And you know we're in 2024 right now if, yeah. if memory served uh, when we were kind of talking about doing this session you did this in 2017. You actually got That's the certification right. and spent right. time doing that. During the course of that eight months, how did you sort of know you were ready? Uh, I know you you graduate, you get a certificate, whatever, but how do you suddenly feel like you're qualified to fix people or help them perform better? I think some of that comes from just working with those practice clients. And you see... In each of the sessions that you walk through, you see the light come on for people in 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 a session, and that's where some of the magic is. You know, somebody makes a discovery about themselves while working with you that they may not have been able to come up with on their own, and. To me, that's the magic of coaching is some working with someone and having that and watching that person sort of bloom and and in flower and grow right in front of you and see in seeing them react to how they are growing and understanding that. There's, you know, there's a lot that they can accomplish. And sometimes it's good to have somebody on your team working with you to help you achieve what you want to achieve. I mean, presumably they come to you because something is stopping them from getting what they want or getting to where they want to go or whatever it is. How do you find out what's actually wrong with them? And I don't, that's not a judgment when I say wrong. It's just, there's something, they're, they're coming to you to help fix them mm -hmm. in some way. How do you dig that out of them? Well, it's, well, okay. Well, let's take, for example, uh, weight loss. You know, we're two months into the year. We're two months past, you know, days of New Year's, you know, New Year's resolutions and you know somebody can come somebody who's been trying for years to lose weight and every time you know every time January rolls around they you know they make the resolution to lose 10 pounds or 15 pounds and by the end of January they're back to where they were and one one of these Januaries, they say they may say to themselves, Okay, I need help here. I need to reach out to somebody to help me lose this weight. So I'm, I'm tired of repeating this cycle. And that 
step of recognizing that they need help is a huge step. It's a huge step, step. And then the next step is to find someone, find a coach that will help them and support them in really losing the weight and keeping it up. Right. So they, they come to you because they, they want to lose weight. They feel like they can't do it themselves. They think they need help, which is from what you're saying, an important first step to recognize that you need it. Yeah. Um, when they, uh, do you coach them mostly um, remotely or do you do so in person? How does it work? I mean, these days, everything seems to be Zoom, right? It's, yeah, in, indeed. I'm working with clients right now via Zoom, and I'm working with folks in the Mid-Atlantic and working with folks in the Midwest. So it's really, it, you know, it's, co the coaching that I do can be done from anywhere, and I can serve anyone anywhere through this. And, so, yeah, I I, I'm asking that partly because from being a journalist, investigative, in some cases, mm -hmm. you and I both know that people are deceptive and sometimes they don't even realize they're being deceptive. So they know they have an issue. They know they have a problem. Yep. They want some help. They come to you and they're not, you, you know, you need to pull out of them exactly what the blockage is. I would guess, you know, is it that they're hiding a box of Twinkies under the bathroom sink? or that they, you know, they're binge eaters at night, or, you know, I guess, let, let me ask you in a more direct way. Sure. How do you find out specifically why they can't do that? Well, one way is what I do is to, we have in the very beginning, even before that person becomes a client, we have a discovery call and we work out and work through what, blockages they may be facing and then at that point we we decide you know if we're a good fit for each other and then we start working together uh in in, in a coach client relationship and we so and we work through what obstacles that they're facing that they're really facing maybe the that box of twinkies may be a metaphor for something else. And so we work with that. We look at what their habits are and we try to find new habits for them that are healthy for them. Um, yeah, it's really me listening to the client, guiding the client and, and walking alongside them to help them be their best self. But are you, you know, you went through eight months of training. Mm -hmm. So presumably from the way you described it, I'm assuming there's some kind of overarching system or methodology. When you hit the clients um, and, and they're sitting in front of you or in front of your screen, are you working a program or coming off of a script or like, how are you kind of going through the process of discovery about that blockage and, getting them on the path to, to actually understanding what's wrong and, and how they can overcome that. Sure. Um, I do have a script or an outline for each of the 12 sessions that we go through. Um, and there's, you know, a specific order that I want to take the client through in terms of, say, if we've been working together for a couple of weeks, we, we, look at you know in the beginning of the session we look at what went well for them the past week and then we talk about whatever obstacles that they may have faced during that week and sometimes that's where the real coaching is you know maybe you know they sort of had a you know they they're still hiding a box of twinkies and so again we work on okay why are we hiding a box of twinkies in the bathroom Let's talk about that. What does what's what what else is going on there? Um, so what, and once we work through that, we start talking about some new information that comes up for that week. Um, and there's maybe 
a lot of times I will have a new piece of information that I want to impart upon the person that I'm working with. And what I also do is once we get through that new information, we usually do some sort of exercise related to that new information to help root that in, help root that new information in. And then we go through maybe one or two action steps for the person to work with and work through for the next week. And then to wrap up the session, I'll talk, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll talk through whatever ahas or insights they may have picked up in our time together for that week. How is this different from, from therapy? I mean, you're not claiming to be a therapist. You know, you don't have accreditation. Um, you know, I, I'm, to use your example of weight loss, I always think, you know, horse, not mm -hmm. zebra. So, mm -hmm. oh, I'm having problems eating. And, and I, it, you know, it's a rep repetitive thing for many years. I'm struggling with my weight. Maybe I should go see a nutritionist or maybe I should go see a doctor. And now I guess Ozempic is like the big thing. You know, it seems like it kills your appetite. Uh, you know, to me, life think landing a life coach is a bit like thinking zebra instead of horse. So, I mean, how are you different from a therapist and, and what are you, is the process different? The outcome that you're trying to reach different or what? Well, the big difference difference between a therapist and a health coach or a life coach we as coaches don't diagnose and we don't treat what we do is we support someone who is looking to achieve a specific personal goal or development goal and we give them steps to take we do follow through and follow through and follow up for the next week but we don't do clinical treatments or diagnoses. I see. Yeah. see. And you mentioned earlier 12 sessions. How do you know it's going to take 12 sessions? Maybe I'm precocious and I only need three, or maybe I need 15. But how do you deal with that when, when you have that exploratory session with a client and realize, you know, I think I can help you, and they agree that you click? Mm -hmm. Yeah. At that point, are you asking them to commit to something I'm asking both from a a sort of uh, you know clinical problem issue, but also from a pragmatic money issue. Sure. Um, you know, because I'm assuming that that you know you studied this, you spent money to get the accreditation. It's now going to be your job, so you you know you need to put food on your table, right? Right, right. And the way the my program works, it works best over. A period of time it's not really three weeks and out um because what would what i'm doing with clients is me is helping them change their habits and some of those habits don't change over two or three weeks all right it's you know it, i don't want to have a case where a client comes in, they go, come in for a week, and then they disappear thinking that they've got the their problem solved, but then they come back a few weeks, maybe a few months later, and we're back to square one. And so I lead, I, yeah, I lead a 12-week program because it takes time for those new habits to take root. And so I want to work with my client, you know, keep tabs on my client, support my client as they are going through this habit change. You know, so in some instances, this might be the first time that someone's been on, that's who's worked with a coach. And so I want to make sure that I'm guiding them properly to the changes that they want to make. I, I see. And just to kind of recap a bit, uh, someone comes to you, you click, you, you say to them, I'd like a commitment of, you know, 12 weeks for the program is ideal. 
They agree to that. And you mentioned earlier that you kind of figure out what it is that's blocking them. You work through, you get them to come up with some action points. How do you, and, and you, you follow up, like you're accountable, but how do you ensure that they're actually accountable? Because if at the end of 12 weeks, they're still hiding that box of Twinkies under the bathroom sink, you know, it either means, I guess, they're very blocked or you're not a good coach or whatever it is. But right. I, I guess what I'm asking you specifically is if you're showing up every week, getting them to try to be their best, how do you hold them accountable for actually being their best? Well, one way is, you know, if you, you know, work with me or work with any coach, you should have a program agreement where what I do for you is outlined and what you're going to do and how you're going to show up in the program is outlined. And when you all, you know, when I agree to that and you agree to that and we sign the program agreement, there is your accountability in black and white. And so there are times in, you know, in those, in the coaching session, in that second part where we try to work through those obstacles together and we really try to try to piece together what's happening. And one of the great things about this program is it's very flexible in that if that person, you know, for two, two or three weeks in, and that person is, you know, still holding that box of, you know, still hiding that box of Twinkies, then, you know, I'm going to spend, we're going to spend the majority, if not in the entire session, to really digging in and getting to the root of why that, that box of Twinkies won't go away. And so it's, it's the flexibility to work with the client where they are it is really important to me because I don't have to be tied down to a script. I can be present with my client with what they need. And I guess, I think what I'm hearing from you is, is you're saying you have a program, you have a methodology, you have a script, but... A, you know, a good life coach will know, okay, that's just sort of the general guideline, but I need to get out of the lane a bit to, yeah. to just kind of coach the client and the client's needs, not sticking to my script if, if something is, is a little bit off of that, right? Exactly. Exactly. I, it's one of the things I love about the program is, you know, if somebody's coming in one day and they're having an issue that they just can't get over and you know, we're not scheduled to, you know, we're scheduled to talk about something else. I'm going to talk about what they need to do, you know, for that session, it, it, you know, what they need to have rather than trying to stick to the script and trying to force them into a place that they might not want to be or need to be. I, yeah, it's when it, something that's really important to me is showing up and that's one way that I can show up for my clients is by being present with them and and in sh showing up for that showing up for them in the way that they need me to we've been talking a lot about the theory the systems the process the, you know the script it's still a little bit gray to me. I, yeah. I know neither one of us is a master of improvisation, but do you think, would you be willing to treat me like a client for a couple minutes and just actually show, you know, the whole journalism credo of show, don't tell, and just show me how Richard Tellefaro operates as a life and health coach. Okay. Uh, I'm your client. You're my coach. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll air a real problem if you want me to. Um, yeah. I mean, no, 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 we're not going to fix it. But before we go to Q&A, yeah. I just would like to give everyone who's listening a taste of who you are as a coach, how it works. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it, it, yeah. I mean, if you want to bring up a, a problem for me, that's that's fine. That's great. So what I would do, you know, when we first log in and check in, 
first thing I'm going to ask you is, so Adam, what's been going well for you the past week? Yeah. Um, okay. I'm in, I'm going in character here. Okay. Uh, so, okay. But it, I'm ready. So I'm, I'm being real here for everyone who's listening. Um, what's been going well for me is I love tell stories. I love to, to write and edit. And in my, my current job, I'm mostly managing managers who deal with people who do that or who deal with public relations. And, you know, some kind of twice removed from what I really love to do and, and am good at. But because we're so busy and there's this event coming up, a lot of the stuff is coming to me to write or read and edit. And man, I'm just hitting it out of the park. Okay. All right. That's that's great. That's fantastic. Now now it's sounds like you might want to you say you're you know, you love to tell stories. And you love, but right now, being in the managerial space that you are, you're kind of removed from that. Is telling, going back to telling stories, something that you like to do? Well, I mean, I, I love doing that. Mm -hmm. It's just the, there was a reason I left. You know, I had kids who were getting ready to go to university. And as much as you love journalism, it doesn't love you back, especially in your bank account. Right, right. Yes, yes. And so so let me ask you, are you interested in going back to telling stories in some way, shape, or form? Uh, I mean, if I didn't have to live in a refrigerator box and eat dog food, yeah. I mean, that's kind of in my blood. Okay, okay. And... And... What time frame do you have in your mind to go back to writing stories and telling stories? Yeah, I mean, it, it's not like I have a lot of road left in front of me. I'm I'm kind of old now, and and I think, you know, I think of everything as a gig of eighteen months or so. So I, it's probably fair to say, like, if, if I wanted to really do this, I'd have to think what does the world look like 18 months from now? Like, how can I put steps in place to, to do that over the next year and a half? Okay. Okay. And now you, you just mentioned the steps that you would have to take. What steps can you take in the direction of telling stories in the next 30 days that will help you be propelled in that direction? Uh, so I, mean, one of the things that, that I think I, I was good at, and you were good at a lot of journalists are good at is, is building sources and they become part of your network. I think probably reactivating my network and letting them know that I have this attention because it's probably going to be like, you know, this top hundred people, you know, who are going to open some door for you just from experience, as opposed to like spinning the wheel and getting lucky. Right. 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 Now, let me ask you, are there five people in that list of 100 that you can reach out to in the next week? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, the only thing I wonder, though, is like, what am I saying to them? Like, do I call them to bitch and moan and complain about my current thing or say I'm looking for something? I mean, I don't, I need to come up with some strategy to do that sure. if, rather than just randomly reaching out. Or I also hate asking people for things directly, especially if I haven't talked to them or seen them for some time. Sure, sure. How about this? One thing you could do is you could reach out to those five people. And rather than thinking of helping, of like asking them directly, just Ask them for one of three things. You, know, you could ask them for advice. You could ask them for insights. And you can ask them for recommendations for the next steps that you want to take at, in your storytelling journey. How does that sound? 
I think that's reasonable. Uh, I, you know, I probably would, being me, probably want to just make a, a list of, of bullet points so that I stay on track. I, you know, once, once a conversation starts with them, it'll be organic, but sure. I think beforehand I probably need to do some prep work. Sure. And how difficult would that prep work be for you? Well, I, I mean, I was just bragging about how I, I, you know, I'm a really good writer. I love to write. And yeah. so I, I'm going to say pretty quick. Uh, I just okay. need to carve off the time to do it. Okay. Okay. And can, so when we meet again next week, um, let, let, so let's, when we meet again next week, your action steps are going to be taking, you know, reaching out to those five people and asking them for those, their advice, insights and recommendations. And we're going to, and we can talk about what, what feedback they gave you. How does that sound? That sounds achievable, actually. Um, Richard, can we, can we yeah. stop it here? Sure. Um, yeah. Uh, jump out of the character. And, yeah. You know, okay. give you a bit of a plus. <laughs> actually, you know, it's funny because I, you know, I went through eight months as well of, of life coaching mm -hmm. and, and it was similar, but you're actually really good at this. I mean, I, I found myself actually sharing with you and you were putting me on the spot and forcing me to, and, and I didn't feel uncomfortably forced, but I felt like yeah. you were really, you kept narrowing the funnel to get me to find out exactly what's wrong, exactly what I could do. And, and it wasn't, you went from my hundred people to five people. You made everything in the space of just a few minutes here more manageable and achievable and was that the goal like was that what you were shooting for that's with that's what the goal was i mean i was it's you know going back to what i said about you know going going down the script you know in that situation i had to wing it while i was listening to you and gathering that information and and this is going to be this is going to sound touchy feely but you sort of have to be guided by your intuition and where, where, and I'm just thinking like, where is Adam going and how can I help guide him to where he wants to be? And so, you know, it's, again, it's, you know, that it, putting intuition into it sounds touchy feely, but that's a part of active listening. And I think that's what coaches it's what I strive to do as a coach. I think that's what we all strive to do, not, you know, coach or not, is really be present and listen to who we're sitting across from. And you can't uh, get good yeah. information if you don't listen. Yeah, and it's funny. You picked out kind of the the pearls in, out of the, the, the garbage from there. And... I also appreciated that you didn't try to solve my problem for me. You wanted me to solve my problem. I, he kept pushing me in that direction. And it yeah. took me a while to go like, okay, he's not going to tell me. He's going to ask me to figure it out or to explain to him and yeah. come up with. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's should not be my job as a coach is to tell you what to do. It's not like we're not sports coaches. We're not. NBA coaches or NFL coaches. We, and I heard this somewhere, I forgot, and I think it may have been the Growth Equation podcast, where as coaches, we walk alongside somebody on their path rather than walk ahead of them. And that, that sounds very like, like Buddha might have said that or something. <laughs> um, yeah. What, um, yeah. I mean, what does it actually mean? Say it again. What does that actually mean? It means we help the client figure out what they want to do and what they want to be. We don't tell the client, okay, you have to do this. It's not like, you know, perfect example, it's a like former Patriots head coach, Bill Belichick, sending in a play to Tom Brady and telling Tom Brady to run this play. That's not what I do. That's not what any of us coaches do. We listen to what our clients 
want to do and help guide them to where they want to be. A lot of times, the clients that we work with know what they want to do, but they don't they either don't know how to get there or they might might need permission from someone to go there. And that's sometimes what we do is we just give you know our clients permission to do what they what they've always wanted to do. Richard, I'd like to again thank you for taking the time. You've spent better part of an hour doing what we said you would, which is demystifying life coaching. It was also fantastic to catch up with you and hear about your own personal journey and your professional journey. It sounds like you're on your way to a really great second act. Um, and I just don't know what to say, except thank you for your time and thank you for sharing the wisdom. Adam, I just want to say thank you for connecting with me. You've given me a lot of inspiration and and, and information as to this next part of my journey. And I really appreciate that. And I really appreciate having this forum to help people understand what coaching really is about and how it can be of help and of service to folks who want to move to another baseline, a different and higher baseline in their lives. That's right. I mean, from what I heard, uh, I would feel very trusting and confident, partly because of who you are and the shared background that we have, but also from the skills that you demonstrated. Uh, even you've been doing this since 2017, but even in the few minutes that we were doing a mock session, I really, you know, went from improv to to sharing an issue with you. And that, that speaks to your ability to draw people out and get them to think about things in a different way. Um, all I can say is I would not hesitate to approach you if I felt blocked or needed some help with my life. And good luck to you. Adam, again, thank you so much. It was This was wonderful. Really appreciate the forum. And again, thank you so much. All right. And thank you, listeners, for, for being here. Uh, I appreciate you taking an hour out of your busy evenings or mornings, wherever you are in the world. Goodbye, everybody. You've been listening to Hearts at Work, a P-Cubed production. P-Cubed, short for the power of positive psychology, is an agency that focuses on career and life coaching to help bring out the best possible performance in people through positive psychology. Thank you for listening and tune in again.